may be seated. If you would turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13, my subject tonight, building a hedge around your family. Spiritual termites have been destroying the foundation of our society. The House of Representatives voted last week to pass the Equality Act, which would allow all types of ungodly activities among males and females and violate your personal rights. What kind of fools do we have that's running this country today? You have to ask yourself that in the light of what is going on. Now, this thing is going to go before Congress for a vote, and we gave you a handout Sunday listing four things on that handout that the Christians should know about this ungodly act. We also gave you the phone numbers of Senator Richard Burr in his Washington, D.C. office and Senator Tom Tillis, D.C. office. And Teresa and I, we have already called, and when I call Senator Burr's office, I got a recording. When I call Tom Tillis' office, Senator Tillis, guess what? I got a real live person, not him, but I got a person on the other end. They assured me that Senator Tillis was not going to endorse that act. That's good. Your, your vote and your call make, makes a big difference. But on that handout, we listed four things that the church should know about this ungodly act. Number one, it endangers the church. Secondly, it encourages the suppression of your religious freedoms. Thirdly, it obliterates women's rights. You know, this nation has fought hard for the women's rights, and under the guise of women's rights, that present administration, they tell all types of lies. They're not doing anything for anyone but for themselves. It will affect your children. So, as I said, Teresa and I, we've already called and let people know how we feel, but I don't know what will happen with this act, but I do know this. You can build a hedge about your family. That's my assignment. I've not been silent concerning what's going on in the political world. I've stood as a watchman on the wall, and I've tried to be as fair and as balanced as a person can be. But I will not stand by idly and be quiet while my nation and, and the religious rights and the freedoms and the constitutional rights we have are being violated by people that care nothing about what our Constitution says. So God is looking for some people, and God is looking for some people that will stand in the gap and make up the hedge for this land. I believe there are some of those people here at Westmoreland, and I've got some pastor friends. They're standing in the hedge, and I've got some that they won't even mention politics. I think they ought to get out of the pulpit personally. They need to give the clarion call if they're going to be a watchman, be a watchman, and let people know when there is encroaching dangers. When I was in Vietnam, we had people that we put on the wall. We called it a berm wall, and they were there, and we had a great big tower that we had people stationed up in that so we could see the encroaching enemy. And when the enemy tried to hit us, we were forearmed, but we were forewarned. We were ready for them, I can promise you that. Look at Ezekiel 13 and 5 with me. God said, you have not gone up into the gap, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. God said, he's talking to his people. He said, you have not gone up into the gap, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand, or you could say to stand, the house, the church, okay, to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. So my subject tonight is building a hedge around your family. Let us pray. Father, you keep touching my heart and leading me to preach along these lines. And, Lord, we're in perilous times, as the Scriptures tell us. But, Lord, we're suited up. We're battle ready, and we ask you to help us, teach us, lead us, guide us, show us the things to come. Oh, God, thank you for the power of your word, the blood, and the Holy Ghost. Illuminate our hearts and our minds. And the church said in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to read a part of a prayer that was posted on Facebook 
this past week. It sounds good. It's very religious, but it's very unscriptural. Now, I'm going to quote, Heavenly Father, who is the head of my life, show up and walk through my house. Good so far. Rebuke and bind all things that are not of you. Counsel assignments and terminate contracts that come against me and those that I love, end of quote. Now, what is wrong with that prayer? I hope you know what is wrong with that prayer because I preached a sermon Sunday on binding the strong man. And in that sermon, we learn that whatsoever we have already bound on earth is already bound in heaven. We learn that whatsoever we've already loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. And God has given us the keys of the kingdom. The church has them, and it's up to the church to bind the devil. It's up to the church to loose the blessings of God. God is not going to rebuke the devil for you. He is not going to cast the devil out for you. He has given the authority to us to use the name of Jesus. We are to rebuke the devil. We are to cast the devil out. We are to counsel his assignment in Jesus' name. God is looking for some people who will stand in the broken gap and say, Devil, you come against me, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. Even David did it under that old covenant. This day shall he give you into my hands. Thus far shall you go and no further. I come against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. The name of Jesus is against you. I got authority in Jesus' name. I have the power of the Holy Ghost, and I rebuke you, and I cast you out and counsel your assignment. That's how you pray. Go and praise God. Hallelujah. You don't pray a prayer of petition when you're dealing with the devil. You give the command of faith, and the church is ignorant to that in the most part. I hope you're not ignorant to that. I've tried my best to teach those principles. Now, the hedge in the Bible, it was a fence that was placed around a vineyard. Now, I want you to get this picture in your mindset because I'm going to come back to, to this. But this is a picture I want you to see. This hedge, it was around the vineyard. It was there to keep the insects, the thieves, the rodents, and the animals from coming into the vineyard and stealing the harvest. But spiritually, that word hedge in the Bible, it means God's wall of protection. It's a wall that God has promised to place around those that come to him in the world of prayer. I believe that most of our trouble comes not because of the devil. I believe most of the problems come because he's a source behind them because we fail to pray and we fail to take our position in Jesus Christ. Now, we're in the world, and there are certain things that are just common to man, but we are not common people. God said, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. So I refuse to live my life in fear. I refuse to go around cast down when I can have the joy of the Lord. I, I refuse to let the devil torment my mind when I can have the peace of God. I refuse to allow him to inflict my body. And I didn't have a good day Monday, and I didn't have a good day Tuesday. But look at me now. Hallelujah. I'm back on my feet, and I was on my feet then. I don't know what I had, but I told the devil, I said, you're not doing that to my body. I will not let you do that to my body. I come against you, and I cast you out. My body is the temple of God, and you will not do that to me. And then I got my Bible out, and I, I read Psalms 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, here's my refuge. I went through the whole thing. Felt so good, I did it again. Then I did it again. I can't tell you how many times I've read it. Hallelujah. I just go back to my secret place because my father, which seeth in the secret place, if I'll pray, I learned something a long time ago. He will reward me openly. Amen? So I believe that the heads down is down in most Christians' lives simply because they have left the heads down. They live in an unprotected life. And they live that life by their own choice. Think about it. They have the blood. They have the power of prayer. They have the authority to use the name of Jesus. They have the power of God's word. But they fail to use the weapons that God has given to them 
to fight in the battles of life. We are in a warfare. We're not having Sunday school tiptoe through the tulips on Sunday morning. I can't tell you how many devils I fight before I get into this pulpit. I can't tell you the things that come against me. Don't even want to tell you. Don't want to give him. I, but I have learned one thing. By the time I get from back there to up here, the anointing of God is going to come over me. Hallelujah. And I'm going to be all right because I know I'm just under attack. You know, if, if you serve God, you are going to have to fight the good fight of faith. That's why Paul told us, suit up, put on the whole armor, because you're not wrestling flesh and blood. There is a devil. And I better move on if I'm ever going to finish this thing. Hallelujah. <laughs> but people fail to use their weapons. And because of that, most people in the church, they are hurting. They are miserable. They are struggling. And they are walking through all types of difficulties. And I don't care when you see them or where they are. That is just the pattern that they live in. I'm not talking. Everybody's going to have a bad hair day. Everybody's going to have something that they're going to have to just, you know, get ready, suit up, and fight. But I'm talking about people that always got the mullet grubs. They're always down. They have no praise. And I, I call a man today, try to encourage him. And, and God has blessed him and blessed him and blessed him. And how you doing? Oh, I don't feel too good, Pastor. Well, he ain't going to feel too good either as long as he talks like that. You will never. I told him, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you think something, that's what you are. If you think the other, that's what you're going to be. That's a principle found in the Word of God. But I've got good news for anybody that's facing difficulty. You can build a hedge around your family. You can build a hedge around your stuff. And you can build a hedge that the devil cannot penetrate. But you've got to learn how, and you've got to build a hedge. And tonight, I'm going to list six ways that will help you to build a hedge that the devil cannot penetrate. If he got through what I'm talking about tonight, he's going to be calling you brother or sister, I tell you. But he can't come through the blood, I promise you that. The devil is a spirit. He has no blood. And if you will keep him in the spirit world, you can whip him every time. So point number one, let's build a hedge tonight. Prayer. That's the first step right there is prayer. Job 1 and 4, let's look at this together. Talking about Job's sons. And his sons went and feasted in their houses. Everyone his day and sent and called their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Look at verse 5. And it was so when the day of their feasting was gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. But Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, you got to realize Job didn't know the narrative that's going on. He didn't know that Satan had gotten permission to attack him and his family. God was actually bragging on Job. And so God is the one that lets the heads down. God didn't cause this problem, but you got to read that story. Now, look at verse 10, because it's a question that the devil asked God. Look at Job 1 and 10. Job said, has not thou made a hedge about him and about his house? Now, how do you think that hedge got around Job's house and Job's children? The Bible says, Job rose up early, and I can just hear Job praying, Lord, I don't know what my children have done. I don't know how they're living when they're out of my sight. But, oh, God, oh, God, I pray that you will hedge my children in. Now, that, that's under an old covenant. He has no days man. He said, I wish I had a days man between God and myself. But the Bible says that a days man is a mediator, someone that comes in and brings and mediates between his two parties. The Bible says under our new covenant, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, that is the man, Christ Jesus. And God has given us tremendous weapons under this new covenant that we have. Now, I thought back about my children. They're all grown and gone. But when my kids were off in college, and you've, we've had children in the military and other places, 
We don't know what they're doing when they're out of our sight. But we can throw a hedge about them through our prayers. You can hedge them in. Now, I, it used to be my pattern when I was working in the business world that every Monday I would go to the church and open that church up and we would meet and pray. And there was a prayer team there, and that's how I started my week. Every week when I was working in the secular world, one hour of prayer to start my week like that. That was the only time I prayed. But when my son Jason was 16 years of age, he went to sleep one morning. He was going deer hunting. He went to sleep at the steering wheel. He flipped his truck end over end three times. When I got to the site of that accident, all that was left of that truck that I gave him was a little ball of metal. But that was a hedge around my son. He walked away. Had a little scratch on it. He was trembling all over. He said, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, it can happen to anybody. I said, but, you know, he went to sleep at the steering wheel. God was really gracious because when his truck landed, it landed on the hood of another truck of two 16-year-old boys that were going deer hunting. And they looking up at the, four, the differential of a four-wheel drive <laughs> right on their hood. And I, I brought my son home, and I said, Son, I want you to get on your knees. I said, the devil meant to kill you today. I said, but God gave you back to me. I want you to get on your knees, and we're going to thank God that you are alive. Go and praise God. God gave me my son back that day. Hallelujah. So the devil meant to kill him, but my prayers had hedged him in. When I told those people there that next time we met for prayer, they said, well, what did you expect? Said you pray it every, all, every time we're in here, hedging your children in. Well, that's what I'm talking about, hedge them in. Now, I don't know if my parents ever prayed to hedge me in, but when I was in Vietnam, you've heard this story. 82 millimeter mortar came whistling through the air with my name on it. My parents had built a hedge around me, and I was protected by their prayers. God woke my mother up 13,000 miles away. She saw me in a vision. And as she prayed, she said, son, the whole world was blowing up around you. Said, but as I prayed in the Holy Ghost, thank God for the Holy Ghost, she said, I saw everything pass over you, and I knew you were okay. Well, church, I'm here to tell you, God will hear a mother's prayer. God will hear a daddy's prayer. And you can build a hedge around your family through the world of prayer. You can be a, build a hedge that will protect them, and you can also build a hedge around them that will draw them back to their roots, to the house of God. God says, I will call your children again from the land of the enemy. God said, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. I'll tell you, God answers prayer, and you can build a hedge through the prayer world, around your family, and around your stuff. Prayer changes things. First of all, it changes us. As we pray, we learn to appreciate the world of prayer. Some people tell me, said, I can't pray five minutes, and I've said everything I know. I said, I can spend one hour in prayer just saying hello to God. All I have to do is call out the redemptive names of God and think about how good he's been to me and, and I just praise his name. I'm thinking about doing a, a sermon on uh, how to cast the devil down. And I, I think I'm going to use the, the Hebrew names of praise. I say even a granny can cast the devil down if she knows how to cast him down. Hallelujah. But number, number one, you can build a hedge around your family by prayer. Number two, you can build a hedge around your family by living under the ministry of a man of God. Don't just sit under anybody. Get around somebody that's called by God, and you know they're called. And you see signs and wonders and miracles. Look at Ezekiel 22 and 30. God said, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. God said, I needed a man. I needed somebody that would speak the truth. I needed a watchman, 
somebody that would stand up with some spine, not afraid of their paycheck, not seeking political position, not afraid of who they would hurt in the church that has different views from theirs. I only got one view. It's the Word of God. I, I believe what God says, and I'm not going to, to violate God's Word by compromising it to some political party. God help us. God needs some people with some spine that will speak the truth. God said, I need somebody to step in the gap of the lies of the enemy and say, here I stand, and I am not going to move. See, it's time for somebody to cry out against the sins of this nation. Or we keep it behind the walls, but we don't want to empower our people to go out. I don't know why people have that attitude. I try to empower you. That's what my call is, to teach you, to empower you, to go out and do the work of the ministry. And if we just let our nation slip away and we don't stand up and stand in the gap, we have violated the gift that God has given to us. I mean, it's time for some people, some leadership to stand up and say, hey, we might be a day late and a dollar short, but we're going to start proclaiming what thus saith the Lord. See, we're murdering our unborn babies. We've taken the Bible and pray out of our schools. We've endorsed alternative lifestyles with homosexuals and lesbians, and most states allow same-sex marriage. Now, don't get me wrong. God loves the sinner but he hates that sin. These are not political issues that I'm talking about. These are moral issues. Then you got people shacking up, living together, and they're not even married. And if you say, you shouldn't do that, they say, you judging me. No, I'm not judging you. I'm just saying this is what the book says. You want to live like that and go to hell, that's where you'll end up. Know ye not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, adulterers, fornicators, effeminates, and effeminate is a homosexual and a lesbian. That's what it is. It says, liars, thieves, and goes on and on. And then God says, and such were some of you. But you've been sanctified. You've been justified in the name of Jesus and by the Spirit of God. We're just not like that anymore. A change took place. We were rebellious before. We rebelled against the Word of God. But when you come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you submit yourself to God. You submit yourself to His authority. You don't violate His Word. You just live the best you can. And when you mess up, thank God we got an advocate. and We can pray and God forgives us. But these political issues that people try to make them, they're moral issues. Our whole nation has gone wild because of sexual perversions and sexual sins. And these things, God said, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. And hell is for eternity. And we got preachers afraid that they're going to hurt somebody's feelings. I need to live right. You need to live right. The whole church needs to repent and get their life in order. This thing is not, you know, something that we can play with. We're talking about our eternal destiny. We're talking about the souls of men and women and, and boys and girls, and, and, and God is a good God, but the church must rise up and preach the Word of God with authority and power and in love. Amen. God is looking for some people in some churches who will stand in the gap and make up the hedge for this land. My heart goes out to people that are bound in sin. I used to be bound myself. Couldn't get free. But I'll tell you one thing. When that nail-scarred hand touched me, God broke every chain. He broke the shackles. You know, we got people that want to deny God. I was a rank sinner. But I never denied the blood of Jesus. I always believed in God. That's one thing I can say. I, I, I was rebellious as far as not giving my heart to him. I didn't even realize that until recently. Why, why did I have all the problems I had as a sinner? Because of my rebellion. Now, when I showed up at Paris Island, South Carolina, I found out real quick, you don't rebel against these people. And so I learned submission. And I thought, I, you know, that I, I never realized that my, the root of my problem 
And the root of every sinner's problem is rebellion, rebellion against God. That's what it is. Now, now the, the fact that I had other problems, that was just a result of the root. That was a fruit of the root of rebellion. That's another sermon. Hallelujah. But let me give you a third one to build a hedge. Unity will build a hedge. Remember when Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah to be spared? He said, Lord, will you spare it for 50? And God said, I'll spare it for 50. And Abraham got down to 10. Do you know that 10 righteous praying people could have spared that city from the flames? In unity, 10 could have spared Sodom and Gomorrah. What do you think the church could do if we cried out in unity for our nation? What do you think the church could do if the church ever got together in unity? At the place of unity, Psalms 133, God said, I will command the blessing. Just get some people working together. Get a family working together. Get a church working together. Get a business working together. Get anything. Get a nation working together. And God says, when I see that, if you're unified according to my principles, at that place, I will command the blessing. That's, that's good. I love that. God's a good God, I tell you. Hallelujah. Now, what would happen to this nation if we cried out in unity? See, we've got church members who vote their party platform looking for political favors instead of voting biblical principles. Now, it took me a little while to write that one down, so I'm going to say it again. We've got church members who vote their political platform looking for political favors. I want a handout. Will you hand me this? Will you hand me that? Vote for them. Come on, let's get real. They are looking for political favors instead of voting for biblical principles. God can make all grace abound towards you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. But you've got to submit yourself to his lordship. And when God says give and Pay your tithe and give an offering, support missions, and God reveals a seed time, harvest time principle to you. You can say no to God, but guess what? You are going to have all kind of problems. You're going to have a bag with a hole in it, and you'll never have enough. If you want to go to supernatural abundance, you will have to obey God. And if you'll do that, eyes not seen, ears not heard. I'm talking about supernatural abundance in your whole, whole life. That, that, that everything in your life comes in line with God's Word. But you're going to have to learn to take your position and head your family in. I had to learn it. Now, do you want to know why our American politics is so corrupt? I mean, I've spent some time praying. I can show you, and I'm going to put a sermon together on where the gospel started, where the, the base of the operation was, how it moved, as Paul, I've studied him recently. God just placed it on my heart. And the base of the church's operation is in America right now. That's where the colleges that train people to go as missionaries are. It's in America. 85% of mission dollars, 85% of missionaries come out of America. Do you know why the devil hates this nation? Because it was founded upon biblical principles. And the major part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is in America. I know we're backslidden. I know we're lukewarm lay out of sin. That's why I'm preaching the way I am. I'm preaching for revival. I want to see the church wake up. I want to see this nation have revival. And, and, and God said, arise and shine. Your day has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. God says, I've given you the keys. Does the church believe that? Or are they just going to sit by like a bunch of mancy pants is not on a log and never rise up and do anything? Where is the leadership? Where are the people calling for revival? Where is it, I ask you? My God. You want my license? You can have it. Hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you why American politics is so corrupt. 
is because the churches have supported their ungodly agenda. And the preachers and the leadership, which have, should have been crying out against these abominations, they have remained silent. They have not empowered their people. They have not called the church together in unity. Oh, we got doctrine, and we got all of that stuff, but it's got to go beyond these walls. It's got to go outside. It's got to go out and affect the culture. Maybe we just need to get back to having some church in houses and going door to door and getting people saved. Hallelujah. But I tell you what, we're headed for persecution. I can promise you that like you've never seen in your lifetime. But it's going to bring the church together. And the church is going to rise up because persecution causes that. That have stayed in Jerusalem had there not been persecution. They'd still be there. But now the gospel's gone all over the world. Hallelujah. Because you can't push their unrighteousness. You can't push the church down because Jesus said, I'll build it. And he's a, he's a builder. He's a master builder. Hallelujah. But see, the church world has bought into one of the biggest lies that was ever hatched in hell, and that's an unbiblical definition of separation of church and state. Number four. Let me give you a fourth one. Hallelujah. I need to move on. Get happy. <laughs> oh, holy angels. Think about it. God has angels. God has dispatched angels. Look at Psalms 34 and 7. I love this. I think they, they have a little party up there in heaven on Sunday and say, let's go down to Westmoreland. Psalms 34 and 7. The angels of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and deliver them. Glory to God. The angels of the glory world, they are camped round about us tonight. They are here. You can't see them unless God opens your eye to see them, but they're there. Look at Hebrews 1 and 14. This is scripture I'm reading. This is New Testament. Speaking of the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Shall be. Look at that. Shall be, not are. Shall be. That means that your children, that you can hedge them in. You can pray. And God will honor your prayer. I'm a product of that. I couldn't get away from God. I couldn't get away from my parents' prayers. You know, the day that I got saved, I went into that church. I hadn't been in there in 17 years and sat down beside my mother. And my daddy come out of his Sunday school class, leaned across me and, and told my mother, said, I told you he'd be here today, sweetheart. Hadn't been there in 17 years. God, he told me, he said, God told me I've heard your prayers and I'm bringing your son in. He had a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom from God. He knew that I would be there. I, I couldn't get saved anywhere else. I prayed all night. I had to drive 60 miles. I was like the blind man going to the pool of Siloam. Go wash your eyes in that pool, and you'll be able to see. I went to that church where he told me to go. Woo! 60-mile drive. Glory to God. And my eyes were open. Woo! I got my sight back. I got my life back. I got my joy back. I got my peace back. I got everything in one moment of prayer when that nail-scarred hand touched me. <laughs> Glory to God. God is a good God. I didn't even like me. I didn't like what war done to me. But I found out God loves me. Hallelujah. And I, I've just tried to, to love on God ever since. Hallelujah. We can pray and claim the promises and build a hedge around our family. God said, I will send my angels to camp round about your children because they're heirs of salvation. You know, as our children grow up and they grow older, they begin to go out on their own. And when they go out on their own, you'll have to turn them over to God. I, I remember our daughter Jessica, our baby, and she was rebellious. and I didn't know what to do with that child. She and her mother couldn't get along. I, I was the one that could get along with her if anybody did. But I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I said, God, I don't know what to do. God said, I want you to release her to me. That's what I did. I got rid of my problem, got it out of my hands, got it in his hands. It didn't take him very long to fix it either. Hallelujah. I had to go through some hard places, and I had to pray and pray 
And my wife and I, we prayed, but guess what? She's serving God today. She's got two little beautiful children. She's got a husband that's saved. I wish they, they were more in, in, into the book than they are. But I'm so glad, praise God, that they're saved. They believe in God. They get, have problems up there. They call me and say, Grand Jerry, these little children, will you pray for me? They already know the power of prayer. And they can pray some beautiful prayers. Train them up when they're small. Teach them how to pray. Let it get down in their spirit. They will never get away from it. They cannot get away from God. He's a good God. He'll hunt them down. Hallelujah. I've learned some things. That is an all-seeing eye that never slumbers. It never slumbers beneath the wings of night. And my heavenly Father watches over me, and he watches over you. When my eyes fall asleep at night, he's still watching. <laughs> when your eyes fall asleep, he's still watching. And the holy angels, that's all around your house, all around your stuff, all around your children, and they travel at the speed of light in a moment. Don't ever give up on that child. Claim that wayward child for Jesus. Stand in the gap. Make up the hedge. It's your seed, praise God. Get serious with God. Get so serious that, God, I desire your presence, and I desire this more than my necessary food. I cannot tell you how many times I've pushed that plate away just to pray for my little children. But I told the devil, I said, you will not have them. You cannot have them in Jesus' name. I refuse to let you have them. I have authority. I have the keys of the kingdom. I'm the head of this home. They're my children. This is my home. Men, take your position in God. Take your position in Christ and let the devil know. You done violated something you should never violate. And I'm standing here in Jesus' name. See, the angels of the Lord, they're there. They just need somebody to pray so we can bring that child safely home. Number five, revival builds a hedge. Look at Psalms 80, verse 12. Why hast thou then broken down the hedge? Psalmist asked that question. I'll tell you why. It was because of the sin of Israel. Now look at Psalms 85 and 6. That was Psalms 80, 12, Psalms 85, 6. The psalmist cries out, Wilt thou not revive us again? See what sin had done in taking their joy. Why do you want to be revived? Said that thy people may rejoice in thee. Why do I want revival in the church? That God's people may rejoice in him. That we can get the bride ready for the greatest event that has ever taken place, the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's coming for his bride. And he's going to come, boom, a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we're out of here. It won't be any time to repent. It won't be any time to pray. It won't be any time to fix anything. He's coming, praise God. He said, if you're looking for him, he said, don't worry about it. He said, you'll appear with him. When he appears, I plan to disappear. Hallelujah. When he comes, I plan to go. Now, when revival comes, it puts a hedge around everything that's going on in your family. I love revival. I'm looking forward to Sunday morning. I'm looking forward to Sunday night. I'm looking forward to hearing Kenny Williamson. I hope the whole church shows up. Invite your friends. Praise God. We've been praying. We've been preparing. And the Holy Ghost, he's not going to disappoint us. I love revival because I love the manifest presence of God. But I refuse to wait for revival to have revival. I found out a long time ago I can live in revival. I am not going to live in the smoke and ashes of yesterday when I can live in Pentecostal fire today. Have the blessings of God. See, we're living in an exciting time when God is pouring out his spirit. He said, I I'm going to pour it out on all flesh in the last days. Revival is going to sweep through this land simply because the church is beginning to experience persecution. It's starting to break out in pockets. People are going to get tired of having their rights violated. They're going to get tired of being suppressed. They're going to get tired and say, 
You're not shutting our churches down. Well, they're not shutting your churches down yet. If you don't know who's shutting the church down, the church is shutting the church down. They come on Sunday morning, don't come back on Sunday night. They might show up on Wednesday night. Every time the church doors open, if you have the energy, you need to be in the house of God. You need to be with people of like precious faith. We are in perilous times. We are in the last days. And demon spirits have been unleashed on our culture. And we had better suit up, be prayed up, packed up, and ready to go up. Hallelujah. I'll tell you one thing. You won't be asleep here at Westmoreland as long as I'm the pastor. Glory to God. <laughs> pastor Rigga, he's going to come right behind me and preach it too. See, what the devil has taken from us, God said, I will restore it. He just needs the people to stand in the gap. He said, I'll restore those wasted years. See, God can give you a crash course. That's what he did for me. And God can make it up to you. I, didn't, I tell you, I was so low, I had to look up to see the bottom. See, what the devil has meant for your harm, God can turn it around for your good. He specializes in things that are impossible. I'm looking at some impossibilities, and you're looking at an impossibility right now. Who would ever thought when, when we were crazy in the world of sin that we would ever have submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And your friends look at you and think you're crazy and say, what in the world do you want to go to church for? And if you like me, you said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. See, when revival, here's the deal. When revival comes to your life, it will come to your family's life. When revival comes to your life, it will come to your family's life. God said, I'll restore what the devil has stolen from you. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency for all things, may abound to every good work. God is so good. God wants to hedge his people in. But it's up to you and it's up to me to build that hedge by working with God and laboring in his vineyards until Jesus comes. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the stuff that you'll ever need, it will be added unto you. Number six and the final one, the Holy Ghost will build a hedge around your family. I love that. The Holy Ghost will build a hedge around your family. Let me tell you about that grapevine and the hedge one more time, and then I'll be through. Now, the hedge in the Bible, it was a fence. It was a fence placed around the vineyard to keep the insects, the thieves, the rodents, the animals from coming into that vineyard, spoiling and stealing the harvest. They were in the grape business back then, and they had grapevines. First, there was, they put a stone wall around it. Then they put a hedge of thorns around that vineyard. And right before the harvest to keep the flying birds and insects out, they would build a wall of fire. I want you to see this. A stone wall that God the Father, he said, I shall not be moved. And then the second wall is the hedge of thorns that represents Jesus. They crowned him with a crown of thorns. And that second wall, it represents his blood that was shed at Calvary. It's a great vine, a great vineyard. I want you to get this picture now. The father is wall number one. The son is wall number two. What about that wall of fire. Well, just before harvest time, when the grapes are ripe, and during the long season, when they have waited and waited and waited, and the Father has watched over us, and the blood has taken care of us, and now the grapes are ripe, and it's time for harvest. And every demon of hell and every insect and every foul bird wants to steal the harvest. God says, I'm going to send 
Holy Ghost fire. That's why I love revivals. It brings Holy Ghost fire. And the fire begins to burn. I want you to see this. This is the way it is in the natural world too. The fire begins to burn. The smoke of his glory begins to rise and nothing can get the harvest. It's been a long night, my friends, but we have prayed. Around these altars, we have stroked the flames of Holy Ghost fire, and it's harvest time. Can you smell the new wine? Can you know, don't you know that you've got to prepare your wine skin for it? Can't be put in the old crusty wine skins. You got to have fresh anointing. Yes. You got to have fresh oil. You got to take this wine skin and prepare it because God wants to send Holy Ghost revival. Can you smell the new wine? I want to tell you, church, you've got a hedge around you. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And when you are saved, God is your Father. And when you're living under the blood of the crucified one, and when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost and full of God's fire, no demon in hell can stop what God, your Father, wants to do for you. Nothing, nothing, nothing can stop God from doing what God has planned for you. Thank God revival fires are beginning to burn all across this nation. And the devil is not going to get this harvest. He's not going to get it because we're going to rise up and build a hedge around our family. We're going to hedge them in. In Jesus' name, let us stand. I raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies. Love you, Lord. I Thank you for revival fire, Lord. We raise a hallelujah in anticipation. Louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm going to sing. And I'm going to sing in the middle. In the middle of my storm. Louder and louder. Louder and louder. You're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. I'm going to sing, and I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Inside of me, with everything inside Hallelujah. of me. Hallelujah! Glory. 